Hello and welcome to the O&M Stockroom. We're your hosts, Brian McGarry and Ken O'Malley. Tonight is episode 30 of Complimentary Cinema. If you're new to the channel, Complimentary Cinema is a program where we review and discuss films that you can watch for free that are available on YouTube. Please be warned, we discuss these films in detail, so consider this a full spoiler alert. So, uh, Ken, it was your turn to pick uh, tonight's film. You just uh, bought a new house, and we're all cozy and moved in, and uh, you got the honors. So what did you pick tonight? I picked the movie entitled Journey to the West, which is a a, um, Chinese film production. What year was that film made, Ken? The movie was made in the year 2013. And who wrote and directed it? It was written by Stephen Chow and Chi Kin Kwok and Zin Hu, which I'm sure those are all wrong except for Stephen Chow. I'm pretty sure on that one. You're going to get shot by somebody for how badly you butchered that, but... That's okay. I give you uh, kudos for trying. So that's... Stephen Chow is the main person, I'm assuming, involved in this production. He's, he, I know him from a number of other films, which I didn't realize till after we watched this. I didn't look anything up about this movie before we watched it. But that is the same uh, person who made Kung Fu Hustle, Shaolin Soccer, a number of other um, comedic Chinese movies. I'm glad that you mentioned Kung Fu Hustle because I could not remember the name of that film. And I think that's the film that this film reminded me of. Yes. Very similar vein. Very so let's uh, let's uh, talk about the three primary criteria of the films that we like to review here. So we like to ask, uh, is this film well written? Is it well acted? And is it well produced? We'll find out over the course of this conversation. Ken, can you give us a uh, cast of characters? Yes. So the main character, his name is uh, <laughs> Zan Zhang. And that is played by Zhang Wen. And then his his counterpart, his uh, other demon hunter friend, is Shu Qi. Uh, she's playing Miss Duan. And then we have a number of different kind of villain characters. We have Bo Huang, who is playing Sun Wukong. We have Sh- <laughs> Shou Lo, who is playing Prince Important. Uh, Xiang Chang Li, who is playing Sand Monk. Uh, Bing Kian Chen, who plays K.L. Hogg. Uh, who the hell else was important? That's the, the main part. Did They're, you get the Sun King, or did you, did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That okay. was uh the uh, Sun Wukong. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so a little. There's uh, a number of other side characters who show up to get punched or kicked or some other violence done to them. So to uh, kick off the uh, the lay of the land here, you're in a little fishing village somewhere in East Asia, and a man's uh, playing with his little girl, and he gets swallowed by uh, some kind of water demon. A short time later, a uh, holy man shows up to uh, thwart this demon, and he catches a big stingray, claims that it's the demon. Alas, it is not, and there is a disheveled, unshaven monk our uh, main hero of this film who comes along to say, no, the demon has not been found. That was just a stingray. Uh, the, the village folks uh, turn their back on the unshaven monk and much to their uh, despair, they end up being devoured. Many of them end up being devoured by the real water demon, a gigantic CGI fish. So yeah, this this fish kind of terrorizes them. Uh, all the people are freaking out, and uh, it turns out our good friend monk, uh, who is trying to tell them that the water demon was not defeated, he has the the true and good information, and he tells the people you know to, to stop moving. You know it won't go after you if you're not moving. He's trying to uh, save a baby, save other townspeople, and. Uh, the people, the family at the beginning was not so lucky. They were all eaten. The father, the little girl, the mother, all of them became fish food. He couldn't save them, but he, you know, it, it really weighed heavily on him. Uh, 
So he, he does the best he can to save the rest of the town. And he, he comes up with the solution of you have to get the, the fish onto the dry land to be able to deal with it. And once he gets the fish on dry land, uh, the, the fish demon morphs back into his original human form, which our unshaven monk then uh, uses nursery rhymes to bring out the good in the demon because he does not believe in killing the demons in order to defeat them, but rather to uh, bring out their inner goodness. And that doesn't quite succeed. And then a lady demon hunter, uh, what was her name again, Kang? It was Miss Dwan. Miss Dwan. Miss Dwan shows up and absolutely roasts this guy and upstages him and captures the uh, the water demon for real. Yeah, and turns it into like a cute little... Uh, like a little pokeball. Yeah, like a little uh, paper animal or something. A nice little tidy package to uh, keep it safe. So this... Uh, what's our unshaven monk's name again? Zhang Wen. I'm sorry. His name is... That's his real name. It's Zhuan Zhang. So our unshaven monk, Zhang... Uh, is really uh, torn up and kind of humiliated about being upstaged so brutally by the uh, by Miss uh, Dwan. He goes back to his master and cries and says, you know, I don't think I did you really pick the best disciple? And his master reassures him and then shoes him off. And uh, Zhang goes out to uh, walk the countryside in search of the other demons. Yeah, so the second one, uh, we actually see from the perspective of a, a young ad- traveling couple who have come to an inn. They have like good, really good pork, and you know they're kind of lured in with the the promise of a, a nice place. But it turns out that the person running the inn was a demon, and it doesn't go so well for them. So when our our unshaven monk shows up, he can see through uh, the ruse right away. He can see that uh, the hospitality is not real. And that the the people that are supposed to be running the inn are all dead. And he also sees that the delicious, crispy, yet tender on the inside roast pork that this establishment is famed for is actually roasted human bodies. It's people meat. It's people meat. So anyway, he, he demands of the demon to just simply uh, reveal himself and that he's not falling for the ruse and... Right as things are about to get interesting, guess who shows up again but Miss Dwan and once again royally, fantastically upstages our would-be hero. Yeah, she's got these rings that she can split into like a million different ways and they can resize them and she she uses them like, I don't even know, like rapid fire shooting and all this crazy stuff. So long story short, they don't quite defeat this, uh, this hog demon, but... Uh, they do injure it and then they scurry off and she tries to, she they, tries they to, go on a little misadventure where a misadventure where they, they try to convince him that uh, there's like this group of wandering demon hunters who are, who are also killing demon hunters. So they don't have anyone to compete with for the bounties. There's a lot of fame and fortune in demon hunting in ancient China, but it, it turned out that it was all a big ruse and it was just her way of trying to get uh, our hero to uh, fall in love with her. She's she's decided that this uh, completely inept young man who can't actually fight the demons worth a damn uh, is the most courageous one of all because he approaches each of these situations with uh, absolute fearlessness armed with nothing but his book of 300 nursery rhymes. So she thinks that she's actually seeing what's really there as where those around her seem to think that she's seeing more than is there. Uh, He refuses her advances and it doesn't go so well for her. Uh, Eventually they end up, uh, uh, eventually they end up at the hole where the sun King has been trapped. A a monkey King who was a King of the demons. He's uh, been put there for the last 500 years by Buddha as a uh, form of punishment and the hog demon is still running wild, still terrorizing people. So he goes to the sun King to try to enlist his aid. 
Yeah, and so uh, he is able to get his aid. He he, he kind of uh, what's it called uh, bribes him with a with a banana to get the information he's after, and uh, he he is able to lure out the pig demon. H L K Hog, K L Hog, was that demon's name? Anyway. Just to just to tie up the, the uh, plot summary here. So he, since our main character is sad because this lady went away, uh, he gets tricked into freeing the Monkey King. And the Monkey King then uh, defeats uh, some other demon hunters. He kicks everyone's butt. He, he royally slays uh, the other demon hunters that we've encountered over the course of the film. Right when you think they're all going to just absolutely own and kick some ass, they get their asses kicked. Because uh, the Sun King is absolutely nothing to mess with. And uh, right at the end, the Sun King tries to uh, fight or kill our hero. And uh, Miss uh, Miss Dwan and Miss Dwan comes along to uh, defend him and protect him. And she ends up dying in turn and... Finally, with their last breath, he, she gets uh, our uh, unshaven monk, who's now bald as a result of the Sun King. She finally gets him to admit that he uh, actually loves her and would love her for a 10,000 years. And then, you know, more stuff happens. Well, and he finds his enlightenment. And he finds his enlightenment. That's a good way to wrap it up. Yep, that's that's what happened. I mean... In the most broad strokes possible. That's what happened in this movie. Now, what actually happened in this movie was a whole bunch of crazy bullshit. A whole lot of crazy bullshit. And most of it was great. Most of it was great. I actually really enjoyed this film. This was Um, one of those movies where, you know, like Brian famously hates CGI. And especially when it devolves into like a crazy CGI mess. But this movie embraced the like crappiness and used it for comedic effect they really did um <clears throat> and for a little 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 horror a little scary well, well one of the things i like about this movie so you have a mix of, of practical effects along with the cgi you have the very first set that we see is an actual wooden set of this very strange fishing village very water world-esque as you pointed out when we were watching it and they they do this great combination of real places and physical objects, and then really just use the CGI for the fantastical stuff that you just couldn't really get away with, with practical effects. And that's when I am okay with CGI. Yeah. And that's when they use the CGI. They didn't really use it much otherwise. True. And like the, the period piece kind of stuff was all practical. Like you said, there was the, um, the set, like where they were in that moving, house car kind of Car- thing? Yeah. whatever you want to call it carriage that's probably a better way to put it um so like all of those kind of places like the place where he's in town where his master is teaching him and there's the big wall in the background mm-hmm. with all the art on it like there's just a lot of great places like that that were all real and that was it kept you in the time period and then the fantasy stuff is where it really went crazy it it kept you grounded when you needed to be grounded which is where a lot of mil- films go wrong they never touch back to reality enough and at least for me that is with practical effects with practical sets practical costumes practical makeup Uh, we we get enough of of the physical real world elements especially in the first half to two-thirds of the film that it really sets uh, it really sets an appropriate tone and when they do use the cgi for example, with the hog demon, I I remarked to you when we were watching this about how it reminded me of the white buffalo, which we watched early on in this series. And that is a giant, ugly, white animatronic buffalo in the 70s. And it looked absolutely preposterous. And when you see similar, <laughs> similar beasts of that nature in this film, they are, you know, CGI rendered and they are silly looking. But if you were to try to do that practical, it wouldn't look any better 
today than it did back then in White Buffalo. Right. So it definitely was the right choice to make. And they didn't try to like pursue realism for those like uh, the demon creatures, you know, and that's what made it work. If they had tried to make it hyper realistic. It would have looked even more fake. Yeah, it would have been bad. Yeah, they, they kept it fake enough and silly enough that it, it didn't bother me at all. And it was effective. They look like storybook characters. Yeah. So that was that was one thing I liked about this. Um, the other thing I liked, too, is the blending of genres. Um, you had mentioned uh, Kung Fu Hustle by Stephen Chow. And that film, like this one, you know, the, both those films blend comedy with drama, with uh, realism blended with the fantasy. And they also both have the the central theme of this, you know, this stupid jerk loser uh, attaining a sense of enlightenment and becoming spiritually pure in a way. Right. They're spiritually perfect. Uh, they're, they're definitely very, very similar films in that regard. I think I liked this one better, though. I think this one, I mean, it had the whole the whole hero's journey thing going for it. It had, um, it was like, interesting, like each section of it was very different. So like, you know, your opening act, uh, they, they kept it moving to these different places and different concepts for the demons. And I think that that made it stronger. Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause honestly, when the, when the film began, I, I thought it was going to be a jaws like movie. Right. And this was going to be like the one, that, that was going to be the demon. You know, we, we knew the film was something about demon hunting. Usually you have a demon, maybe two. I, I was banking on we'd have one demon. I had no idea what the budget of this film was or what kind of production value it had going into it. But yeah, we had several demons to pick from. You had, uh, you know, it was a absolute cornucopia of uh, CGI creatures. And the first two demons didn't have much personality as people. It was mostly just their their monster form. Um, the, the human for the second one was just like pretty and like gestured a lot. Pretty in a very mannequin esque way. That was very unnerving and unsettling and very effective. Yeah. They gave his face this, uh, glassy kind of wet looking appearance mm-hmm. just and like just fake the, and just the, the expression in the eyes was, I don't know. It was, it was cool. Yeah. But like it was good because they made those ones more kind of primal, I guess, and they didn't t- they didn't speak. And then the third one was completely different, in the fact that he was like like a charmer, you know, he was like a schmoozer, and uh, he looked great, both as a human and as his demon form. Like I loved his monkey form. Yeah, the monkey form was fantastic. Um, it it was very Wizard of Oz. That uh, the the flying monkey, the flying monkey thing. He had the flying monkey thing down, but he was like the general of the flying monkeys, right? For the wicked west, wicked witch of the east. Yeah, it was just it was a great outfit, and you could tell there was some practical makeup going on. Maybe combined with some CGI, it's a little bit. It was kind of hard to pinpoint it, but it was well done. Yeah, I mean, like that goes back to too though, like all the costumes and everything like that. Like those pra- are practical, and they were great. The Monkey King's costume was great. The main people all had unique looks. You could easily tell who was who. Um, even just like the guy who uh, is like always coughing and they're throwing the flower petals. <laughs> That's like one of the demon hunter guys. And it's like all, they all had unique powers that made him stand out. They all had unique looks that made him stand out. And so even though they didn't spend a whole lot of time building character, you know, just a couple lines and a couple scenes was good enough. It kind of reminds me of the, you know, that phrase, there's no small parts, only small actors. So you had a lot of people with small parts in this film, but they definitely all made their mark. Yeah. Uh, great case in point is the almighty foot. A demon, an, an aged demon hunter with long, flowy, silky white hair who has one tiny little foot on a tiny little leg, but he can use his uh, his magic or his power to make that absolutely gigantic and just smash anything with it. And that's both used as, you know, for comic effect, but also when you first see him, it's a little bit awe inspiring. And there's a nice blend of that, of the, 
of the comic comic and the silly and the serious. I think that's a great thing is that all of the powers are practical and also used for comedic value. Every single one of them. Every single one. Yeah. Which is great. You know, they're well, the one thing when they need to be and then the other thing when they need to be and it all flows together. And then there's, you have uh, Miss Dwan. So she has this one golden ring, but she can also make it infinite rings, which is also silly in its way. There's one scene where she just has these two endless stacks of rings that she's just shooting out, trying to defeat one of the demons. And it's, it's, it's great. It reminded me very much of, do you ever see the pizza thrower? The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles toy? Uh, ye- my brother had that actually. It was just like that. She it was is. doing pizza thrower, throwing these rings at, at that's the guys. A, that's it's a great one. Big stack of rings, tossing them. Just endless, and, endless, endless. And she used it to make it like a, a, a engagement ring too, to try to trap the uh, our, our our monk character. Uh, he was always, I always, he was a damn fool for saying no. <laughs> I'll just say that she was very nice. Very nice. All right, so uh, best performance in this film, Ken? I would say I really like the Monkey King. I think he was my favorite. That's a good choice. Or (laughs) the guy with the blood. (laughs) (laughs) The guy with the blood. Oh, yeah, he was good, too. He was just a minor character, but it just stands out. It's, It's a little harder for me to judge a film like this that's a foreign film. Um, cause so much of, cause when you think about the performance, you know, so much of what you base on that is the tone of their voice. Is it appropriate for the situation? Is it, yeah. you know, are they making appropriate facial expressions? And this film is so all over the place. And especially early on, a lot of those early characters in that fishing village dial it up way past 11. I, I, and you know, culturally, it's, you know, certainly distinct enough that I'm not going to be able to pick up on all those cues. So for me, it's kind of hard to pick one. Well, that's why I think it it's the opposite way. Like, it's hard to pick out a bad performance. I think everyone did a great job. Yeah. So good cast all around. Not a lot of speaking roles necessarily, but all the, the supporting people did such a great job. It definitely had that ensemble cast kind of feel. You, you had your two main uh, two, three people, but nobody felt uh, superfluous or extraneous in this one at all. Definitely agreed. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the sound editing and mm. music choices in this film. Sound really shown a couple times. Shined? Shown? It was shiny? The sound design... Shown through. How's that? Several times in this film. The sound really was highlighted. <laughs> <laughs> that it was and uh i think the sound effects were great they they use them comedically uh as as oh, highlighted no. <laughs> as highlighted during the during fight the with, in the end scene the fight with the second demon in the inn where when when the people were punched they sound like squeaky dog toys and their faces kind of like like squished in that was fantastic and there was just a couple different places like that the water demon in the beginning, uh, they used really good sound with people thwacking and, and jumping on these boards. And you, you got the sense of the weight of things uh, and like obviously all this stuff like and obviously all these things also were getting knocked over, splashing into the water. They just. That's just even just like the effects. So there was actually songs in this movie. Yeah, because. Uh- yeah, just talking about the the genre b- blending a little bit. This was also technically a musical. There were several musical numbers. I, I there was at least two. Was there more? Well, then there was the credit song. There was the credit song, but the uh, they actually stop and sing twice in this film. Yeah, and uh, so we have a comedy. You have a musical. It's definitely a drama. It's fantasy, and almost also a period piece, and action, and action. And it's also a kung fu movie, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And it's a monster movie. Mm-hmm. And it has elements of horror. Absolutely. I mean, is there anything that this film doesn't have? It's it's not a cowboy movie. It's not a cowboy movie. 
And there's no nudity. It's it's uh, fun for the whole family. No, it's played pretty straight, other than all the blood. Like the redu- there. The, like if the, the blood gets two thumbs up for me. Yeah, well, it, it was perfect comedically, but like if you took the blood out, this is probably a, a not a family movie, but you know, oh, this is totally a family movie. I don't think so. <laughs> it's definitely a PG. I, I say a, a little girl gets eaten by the first demon. Yeah, it's a PG. I'm just saying. I don't know. I I grew up watching RoboCop. That guy shot rapist in the dick. Yeah, and that was an R-rated movie. <laughs> but it should have been PG, PG-13. Whatever. Anyway. I have a different metric for these things. The point is. The point. And what was the point? Uh, you don't remember anymore. We were talking about sound. <laughs> <laughs> the sound was great. There was, oh. there was The background music was good. The song that really stuck out like a sore thumb to me was the very last song at the end of the film. Mm. It sounded like a Chinese Las Vegas show tune, which did not really, it felt incredibly out of place. Uh, But that could also be just a cultural difference there. I think they just try, they may try to make an energetic song and then it just didn't, it didn't quite come across. They They were trying to liven it up a little bit at the end. Yeah. But that last little bit is kind of a downer. Well, no, they're, they're walking. They've assembled the team. This is like the. I mean, the ending of this movie really is the start of a franchise or something. It's it's like the, the Chinese demon reformed demon Avengers. I mean, basically. Yeah. I mean, there is a sequel. Am I right? I have no idea. I think there is a sequel to this. I would expect it, given the content of this movie. I would expect nothing less. This seems like a movie that, I mean, I did no research, but this seems like a movie that would have been well received. At least in China. And that's, re- I mean, for them, that's all that matters. That's a lot of people. At least a billion. So. Probably more by now. So, yeah. So. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to talk about, like, just production-wise or anything else that stood out to you? I think we covered it. Okay. So, final uh, final recommendation, Ken. Would you uh, think that this film uh, fulfilled our three primary criteria? Was this film well written? Yes, absolutely. Uh, do you think this film was well acted? I think we covered that one. Yep, that's an affirmative. Well produced. I definitely do think so. Yes, I think so. It, it meets all three criteria. It was colorful. It was bright. It was exciting. It was funny. It it, it did everything it needed to do. It was a lot more movie than I was expecting to bite off tonight and in a very good way. That is a wrap for tonight's episode here at the O&M Stockroom. We are your hosts, Brian McGarry. And Ken O'Malley. If you enjoyed this segment of Complimentary Cinema, more episodes can be found at omstockroom.com, along with links to our Patreon page and various streaming outlets. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back next week with an all-new episode. (laughs) 